you've told me once that love is no longer spelled time, T-I-M-E. It's something mm -hmm. else. Well, it, it used to be, you know, and we would hear the commercials and think love, you know, T-I-M-E. And I think that's good. But I think, Dan, that there's something that has replaced that. Or it's even more important, but it, it includes time. And that is your attention. I truly believe that one of the greatest gifts we can give our spouse or partner, even our kids, is not necessarily our time. It's our attention. You're listening to Get Your Marriage On, the fun and spicy podcast, bringing you new tools and fresh ideas so that you can be the sexiest couple you know. If someone were to ask you, what's your definition of intimacy? How would you answer that question? And how would you explain to another person how you can develop more intimacy in your marriage? Also, how important are communication skills in an intimate relationship? And what things interfere with our ability to communicate effectively with our spouse? That's what Dr. Dave Schramm and I talk about today. Dave and I go way back. He was one of my keynote speakers of my second Get Your Marriage On live event back in 2019. He's a professor of family life and human development and family life studies at Utah State University. He has his PhD from Auburn University. And he married his high school sweetheart, Jamie, and they have four children. He loves peanut M&Ms, and the Shram fam lives in North Logan, Utah. Well, Dr. Dave Shram, welcome to the Get Your Marriage On podcast. Oh, man, Dan, I'm so excited to join you. Thanks for having me on. Thanks. Just so people can get to know you a little better, can you tell me of a funny story from your honeymoon? <laughs> what we stayed at the anniversary inn in Salt Lake City. So we stayed there, you know, our, our wedding night actually. And yeah, they, they have these big jetta tubs. And so we, we get in the jetta tub and we have our little grape juice and great time. And then I put the, the glass, which is now empty on the side of the tub. And I go to get out, Dan, and I actually, I hit it with my foot. And it hits the floor and it shatters. So there's just, so here we are barefoot in this romantic moment and the glass shatters all over. And I just look at her and I'm like, pause everything. <laughs> and I get these towels and here I am, right? No clothes on. And I'm trying to push all of this glass into this corner behind the, the toilet so no one will see. <laughs> anyway, it was just, just one of those things it, we have to laugh now looking back and think, you know, sometimes things don't always go as, as planned and I just will never forget the shattered glass getting out of the tub story. <laughs> <laughs> Especially on your honeymoon, you're already like, things need to go perfectly. Like you yeah. want things to go in a certain way. Oh yeah. That's that was not on the list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had a similar experience on an anniversary. We we're at a hotel with a jetted tub and we had the, uh, the cider. Like oh yeah sparkling cider whatever yeah. I don't have a can opener I can't I don't I don't know why I didn't think I thought I could be tough enough so I'm trying to open it with my thumb and I slice my thumb and it just bleeds oh no <laughs> so yeah that, oh, that kind of ruined the moment too that's awful <laughs> yeah yeah sometimes they just we start in the bathtub yep <laughs> <laughs> you got your bloody thumb and your finger oh man yeah we have to look back and laugh right I want to talk about intimacy today. What's yeah. your definition of intimacy? I love the definition, Dan, that I heard. It was a professor, Davy Chandler, back at UVCC back in the day when I went there. And he said this, and I'll never forget it. And he said, he's like a biker guy, so I just have to do it in his voice. He said, intimacy means into me, you see. And I remember just thinking like, oh, this guy had leather with long hair. This is exactly right. So I love that because into, into me, you see, it kind of sounds like intimacy, but it's more of that, that you see my soul, that you see deeper than, than, than the outside, that we share something that we don't share with any, anyone else. And you know things about me that no one else knows. So it's into me, you see. That to me is, is true intimacy, soul to soul. Gotcha. And there's also the... I see into you. Yes. On it too, right? Yes. You got to open up to allow someone to see you, but you also have to be willing to see into that. Yes. Yeah. It takes vulnerability, right? A little yeah. bit of risk, a little bit of when we build that relationship. Now, especially in the beginning of stages, you're building physical intimacy, emotional intimacy, and then that, that vulnerability. So you truly do into me, you see, and you allow someone else to peek into your soul. So, Let's talk about happy relationships too. So there's mm. this intimacy component. There's really seen into a soul. Uh, but I think there's 
more to it than just that vulnerability and willingness. What, what now as a researcher and sorry, as a professor, you teach this concept all the time. What are the foundations for a happy couple? Mm, yeah. You know, it's kind of evolved over time. Um, Dan, I, I used to think, you know, 20 years ago, going through all this and, oh, how important it is for managing conflict and communication, all these things. And those things are important. We'll get to some of that later. But really, for me, a happy we starts with a healthy and happy me. And it's really about making sure that we're in a good place uh, ourselves, individually, that care for self, that we're eating right, we're resting right, we are moving our mental health is right because um, it's really tough when we're not in a healthy place individually, personally, with mental health challenges, struggles, or teenagers, or stress. All this stuff then spills over into our couple relationship. So, so really, not in a selfish way, but it starts with me uh, or you, right? Our partners themselves and making sure that we're in a good spot because, yeah, happy, healthy people, that's what creates happy, healthy relationships. So is there a time in your own marriage where things weren't great, you weren't happy, and then you looked at yourself and saw, this is the problem, and how did you fix it? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I think early on, and many people, well, the research suggests, you know, those first few years, first even like seven years, can be really a, a tough time. So we're getting to know each other. We kind of have, you know, differences. We're managing all of this. The stress is, I'm going to school. We have, uh, at the time, we have a, a newborn. Uh, maybe she was, you know, six months or so. And, and it was just, we felt like we we're just connecting because I was going to school and she's home with the baby and the baby, you know, gets sick and colicky. And then from school, I go to work. And so a lot of the stress, uh, and so I have no time to exercise, right? No time to eat, right? I'm just going and grab some fast food and go to work and then get home late and I'm tired and put the baby to bed. Sometimes Dan, I'd put her to bed and then I would stay up and, and study and study and steady, steady. So it, it got to this point where like, okay, you know what? This isn't working. This is really, really difficult. Um, and our, the sexual intimacy, it was rare if you know, non-existent because we weren't lining up and I wasn't taking care of myself and she, she wasn't as well. So there was a point where we said, you know what, let's, let's have you go to, there were some cooking classes, some, some cooking class, some things that you want to do that are healthy for you. And even having kind of girls night and you go do those things. And I need, I need to start exercising. I need to start eating better because it's sleeping, getting more sleep instead of staying up till 3 a.m. studying. I said, ah, we need to get things back on track so we can get back on track in our relationship because we really were just ships passing in the, in the night, staying busy. And it was affecting us. Yeah, it really was. And here I am studying marriage, studying family. And, and I wasn't taking care of, of me and us. So yeah, it's, it's so critically important. I like what you're saying. Happy couples are made up of happy people. Absolutely. You can't be an unhappy person and expect to have a happy marriage. Yeah. Yeah. It's really difficult to go that way, isn't it? Some people really struggle with like, but that seems selfish. Yeah. It's really selfish of me to really feel like I can take time for me. Any advice for couples that get stuck in that thought? Yeah. And this may be a bit gender, but I think a lot of times women almost be like, you know, this is my role as a mother or a cook and I've got to do this. I've got to live up to this, to this standard and I can't, it's, it's serve and it's help, you know, bake cookies for this person and then take this child to the piano recital and run, 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 instead of slowing down. So yeah, those, those things are important, but learning to say no and learning to say, I'm good enough. I, we have a, a good enough, you know, we need to actually take care of ourselves, not in a selfish way. This is really, I see it as an investment. It's an investment in the relationship, bringing your best you to the marriage. It, it's a gift. And so that is not selfish at, at all. It can of course get swung out that way and be gone all the time. And, you know, these lavish trips and stuff um, on yourself, but yeah, we've got to learn to be able to slow down and take time for, for you so you can strengthen us. All right. Very good. So what are some specific skills or is there a script you can give me like step-by-step -step things and what you can do to build better intimacy and be a better couple? Yeah. You know, I, again, if this was like 20 years ago, Dan, I'd be like, oh yeah, absolutely. Here we go. Let's, let's do this with all these skills. Um, so I do have to yeah, all right. Date night. Uh -huh. I, yeah, it's all these things. That, yeah, if you just do these things, like three uh, formula, things, you're gonna have a formula. Yeah, it's it's called the prescription approach. So, 
I'm honestly, I'm not a huge fan of um, skills. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not anti-skills. Skills are important. Communication, managing conflict, those things are critically important. But I see them almost as the, the outside of a nice shiny car, whereas the, the inside, the engine, the engine is really, it's our heart. Getting our, our hearts right in the right place. And so I really feel that the happy, healthy relationship starts more with will than skill. That it, okay. it's about us. It's about having compassion, which is, I don't think is a skill, you know, about kindness, about gratitude. It's about turning um, outward and seeing our partner with, with understanding, with uh, being aware of their lives, those types of things, which are not into this, you know, okay, now you need to say, you know, reflect and I, here's the floor, here's the I statement. Now you reflect. So what you're saying is, and I feel, I think we can get too caught up in some of that. And actually the research, I know this is getting kind of nerdy, Dan, but the research is actually showing exactly right. That the focus now is on virtues and values instead of skills. They're, they're showing that a lot of the skill stuff doesn't make uh, as much sense for many couples. It just makes us more skilled fighters. Because I can say all communication stuff, but if my heart's not right, yeah, then uh, it, it's just going to make me a more clever fighter. It's just using it as a weapon. It's manipulation, yeah. right? That, yeah, I was about exactly. to ask you about that specific skill too, and, and you brought it up. The Okay, when you have a disagreement, you reflect back what they're saying to make sure <laughs> they hear what you're saying, and then, and then oh, you man. do this two-step, and then all of a sudden you understand each other better. And there are, there are even marriage therapies built around that whole concept. Yeah. But, uh, if they had success, I think it's short lived because it doesn't address the engine, like you said, yeah. the heart, the heart of the matter. Yep. Yeah, that's right. I remember, so there's a little funny story. I remember coming home. So I'm at Utah State, I'm a master's degree student and learning about all this stuff. And I come home and my wife and I, we get into a little argument. And then I said, So how does that make you feel? And she <laughs> looked at me, Dan, like, what are you doing? Where did you learn that crap? And I was like, oh man, this stuff doesn't work, right? So we have to be really careful with the, that prescription approach of say the right thing in the right time, in the right moment, you know, the right tone and all this stuff. We have to be um, genuine and because we, we know how to communicate. We, we kind of con, you know, the, our partners into marriage. And so we know how to communicate. I think sometimes, sometimes I don't think we dare to risk because maybe we're burned. And so we have to talk about some vulnerabilities there, but as far as giving like a certain sentence to say in a certain way, yeah, not, not, a, not a big fan. Yeah. The research is showing that's, it's not working. All right. So back to that scenario, you're as the master student, you come home and have an argument instead of saying, how does that make you feel, honey? What's uh, like, what's the, what's the better move to make? Yeah. I call it holding so up the emotional mirror. Yeah, exactly. We talk about what not to do, right? Mm -hmm. so just mm -hmm. repeat a bunch of things like a script. But what do you do? Yeah, you know, when emotional wounds, I like to say, require emotional first aid. And so even asking myself this question, if I give my whole heart to my spouse or my partner, what it has occurred to me to do or to say so if I'm all in, right, I'm giving her my all in attention and she's telling me about the rough day or how she's disappointed or discouraged or whatever it is, then I offer sympathy, compassion. That's it, heartfelt. That's not the can, but it's saying like, oh man, I am so sorry. So what, I mean, what was that like? Or what happened? Or why do you think that was, you know, why would she say that? Or whatever it is on her and I'm joining her, genuinely joining her. I'm aware, I'm interested. Even if I've had a really rough day myself, I turn outward and I give her my heart, my true, I try to really understand and to feel what she, she is feeling. And, and that's more than a, than a skill, right? That, that's my heart. That's getting the internal um, thing. So I, I'm a big fan of that, that emotional, you know, being on the same um, team emotionally as well and simply reflecting and not trying to jump in and say, well, why don't you just do this? Or why don't you try this? Because research, when our heart rates are really high, we're experiencing a strong emotion. It's not the time to, to teach or correct or anything. It's simply just to have compassion and listen and offer that emotional first aid. Mm -hmm. I think about that popular YouTube video. It's not about the nail. Uh, yes. Many of our listeners may have heard about it. If not, I can include it in the show notes. But yeah. it's a caricaturization of, of a couple arguing. She has a big nail sticking out of her forehead. Yeah, yeah. It's like trying to tell her, like, you know, trying to fix it. <laughs> yeah, just get that nail. It's not about the nail, man. Just listen to me. Yeah, and she's like, I just want to be heard. It's like, 
this must be really hard for you. Yeah. Like, Thank you. You, you understand me. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, it's, it's that emotional connection. Yeah, yeah. for sure. But, but there's a little bit of truth to that is what I'm trying to say, especially when, like we said, you're emotionally stimulated. You can't really process information very well. That part of your brain is not in up full operation. Yeah, yeah, Except for sure. It's called flooding. Like mm -hmm. you're, you're flooded with emotion. You can't think and process rationally. And the, the tricky thing about our brains is we don't even know that we're doing it to ourselves in the moment because you can't process enough to recognize that. Yeah, that's right. So when you start feeling that, it's important, I think, to just to pause, you know, to take a deep breath. There's so power. You've probably heard, you know, there's just the power of actually a deep breath to get oxygen to the prefrontal cortex and all this technical stuff. But honestly, just taking a breath. And you know, another one that I just read by, um, man, it was a, a great book called uh, Unwinding Anxiety. And it's simply this little hack. And he says simply to, to, to do this. And this is more probably on your own when you feel yourself getting heated up. But he said just to go, hmm. Isn't that interesting? He just said H M M M M M, just hmm, and it's pause and just to get curious about those feelings. Now, mm -hmm. okay, whoever's listening to this right now, don't do that in the middle of like your wife's like just going off and you're like, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't think that'll go over very hey, well. That's not going to go over very well. So, so scratch that hack. That's it's a little only, condescending. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> that's what it is. So only kind of it's, it's a personal one when you feel like you're getting really anxious and worked up, just make it. Mm, taking your You're breath yeah. to yourself, not to your spouse. Got it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because that would knock over. <laughs> All right, cool. Okay. So we talked about intimacy. We talked about mm -hmm. happy couples need happy individuals. We talked about mm -hmm. things aren't so scripted all the time. It's more of a matter of a heart. I think you'd agree emotional connection is important. How, mm -hmm. If it's all a matter of a heart, what are the things people need to understand and be to have better emotional connections in their relationships? When I share this and when I talk about this, um, Dan, I love to, I love to talk about four principles um, that are helpful, maybe for people to remember to to even kind of hold on to. The first one is is I, I say it's search inward, and so we we talked a little bit about that. That's about you know you and discovering what are my strengths and and what can I do in this relationship. The second one is is turn outward. So searching inward is about you. Turning outward is never about you. So these are, these are things like, okay, honoring, you know, commitments, that loyalty, this is kindness. This is that little text in the day. This is the, Hey, my wife loves crumble cookies or whatever. And I know this one is it's, it's on this week. So I'm going to get that on the way home or she likes a clean car. I'm going to take it. I'm going to vacuum it and wash it up for, her. um, so these little random acts of kindness, those are those those little deposits into the bank, or I call it into the into the relationship pool. But that's that's turning outward, really giving our our partner, our spouse, our whole hearts. Um, the third is look upward. So search inward, turn outward. Looking upward is keeping that that hope, that that finding that meaning um, in our relationship. And being able to come together, which leads to the last one is, is press forward. So look upward and press forward about finding hope and meaning and then pressing forward through the difficult times. And sometimes that's a counselor. Sometimes that's a, right, a podcast, a resource, a book, a website, turning um, to something that can be helpful. It's pressing forward through those struggles, staying, staying committed. Okay. And we're not talking about, you know, abusive, those types of, of relationships. This is a a genuine healthy relationship that we want to move forward, but we feel like we're stuck in a rut, then it's, then it's time. It's okay to turn out or to, to look for those resources, but to not give up, not to give up hope in those, in those relationships. So I, I again, I, I mentioned this earlier, I, I compared to this relationship pool, all couples, Dan, we begin our relationships, maybe it's a kiddie pool and the, the water is really represents the, our emotional connection. And the okay. more that we go out on a date, the more that we're talking, we laugh, that's adding a cup of connection to the relationship pool. And so the more that we add that cup of connection, it gets deeper and deeper. And what that does is a couple of things. Our connection, when we feel really close, there may be a harmful thing that's said or a smart remark, or I come home and I'm, I'm pretty short. I'm like, what have you been doing all day? Or I say something really mean. If we have that depth of connection, then it's it takes a lot, right, to drain that pool and be like, hey, you know, a big rock into a pool kind of absorbs it, makes some ripples for a minute, but then we can, we can come back together. So constantly adding cups of connection into our pool. What I see that often happens um, 
is it's unintentional. I call it relation dehydration, basically, is we stop adding cups of connection to the pool and then we drift apart. We slowly mm-hmm. drift apart for sexual intimacy, for example. If it's been days and then, then it's weeks and we start to feel like we are drifting and before we know it, right, uh, in a pool on a hot day, on a hot summer, like down in St. George, a little kitty pool, that's going to evaporate. You may not see it. But over days and weeks, then it starts to become more noticeable. And that's what happens in relationships, Dan. If we're not constantly adding cups of connection to the pool, we start to just kind of drift apart and live our lives instead of coming back for that important connection, that emotional connection, that be that sexual relationship where we can connect. That adds like a big, you know, five gallon bucket to the pool uh, of connection. So honestly, it's, it's, these big, you know, lavish, uh, you know, go on a cruise. Those can be fun things. And I love looking forward to those big ones where we add a lot of, of um, water, emotional connection to the pool. But it's the consistent little things, right? That happen in the morning, in the afternoon. That's what leads up to a great emotional connection at night. It's, it's adding that cups of connection during, during the day. Yes. And that's why I love the Intimately Us app, because that's exactly the, the premise of it. Every day on the home screen, there's a little daily intimacy challenge that's designed to do exactly that. Just a little cup. And th- their challenges are small. They're, they take five minutes or less for most of them. But it's yes. to add this, you know, let's add more cups of water to our pool. I was, I was hoping you'd say bathtub <laughs> to go along with yeah. our theme today. <laughs> but we'll go with kiddie pool. That's good. Yeah. You know, yeah, we're going to add more to this. So there's more depth. And yeah. you can handle just the ups and downs of life better because you've built up a reservoir of water. Yeah. 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 I want to point out something real quick with that because length, you know, being together a long time doesn't necessarily equate to depth. Does that make sense? I can be yeah. married 30, 40, 50 years and still have a puddle yes. because we just, we're still, we're together, but man, there's no, there's no connection. There's no closeness, attachment. Uh, likewise, you know, couples have been married maybe a few years, maybe they've gone through some craziness and health challenges and things that have, uh, you know, moved across the country and they're, they're really alone where they have to really cling together and add that connection. So, so it's not necessarily how long you've been together, but how much you're pouring into your relationship pool. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Very good. So you're a researcher and you research connections and marriages and families. What are some of the things you're observing that are causing disconnection? Oh man. Yeah. And nowadays it feels like it's, it's, it's all over the place, right? we we have all kinds of things that are pulling us apart. I, I talk about some D's when I do this, you know, just dis- destructive decision-making, you know, it's one-sided decisions. I talk about how reactions can wreck relationships, but, but the one that, that seems to be more kind of our time more of this modern challenge, it seems to be more of this digital distractions, this, this techno as is Brandon McDaniel, a good friend of mine, actually um, researcher coined that term. This techno happens when technology interferes with that face-to-face, that closeness, that, that connection. And you know what? It, it's a problem. I did a little survey, um, Dan, and surveyed in, in some of my research, 88% uh, of those surveyed, 691 parents across the United States said that technoference is a serious problem in society, and 68% said it's a, it's a serious problem in their own family. So, and, okay, and let me tie this back into sexual intimacy. So, 50, here's another one: 55% of those in the survey they said that they wish um, their partner would spend less time on their phone and more time with them, mm-hmm. and 25%. So, one out of four said that their partner's phone habits in the bed is disruptive to their sexual relationship. That's a lot of couples. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And probably the other ones are probably not telling the truth. So I, I'm guessing that that's even higher higher than that. Uh-huh. But we have to be very, very <laughs> mindful. I don't have a problem. It's my spouse that has a problem with this one. I don't have a problem with my phone in the bed. Oh, that's what it was. It was actually, it was higher for those who said my partner needs to spend time, you know, put down their phone. That, that's how it is. Yeah, that we're often not aware. So I'm a big fan of kicking technology out of two places. Okay, and the two places, um, there was three. It was, you know, bathrooms. But yeah, forget we have lost that battle. You know, when's the last time you went to the bathroom without your phone? Right, 2010 probably. <laughs> so it's down to two, and that is kicking technology off of tables and out of beds. And, and because those in my mind that are really sacred spaces, 
those are moments of connection, right? That is where we connect at the table when we're talking last time, you know, we went out to eat and I just look around all these couples on their phones and think, Oh, put down your phone. You've got to be able to emotionally connect and talk. And then, and then beds. I think that, um, it depends on the couple, right? If both couples are fine with it or whatever, then, but often what happens is one partner thinks that they're, they're fine with it and they're really not, they're just not saying anything. And internally there's this, there's this resentment and things. So being very mindful, I would say digital distractions is, is one of the, the biggest causes of, of disconnection today. So it could be video games though, you know, pornography, TV, video, whatever it is, social media, um, man, it just seeps into a lot of, a lot of relationships right now. So, um, just being mindful of that mindful of our own habits with technology. That's so what you said reminds me last Saturday, I went out to eat and, uh, is is a nice restaurant and the the table next to us a couple comes and they're kind of dressed up nice and they sit down and they each pull out their phones and they're on their phones and i got really judgmental like because uh, i know this right it's so important uh-huh. to connect with those around you and then i realized oh yeah there's only a digital menu <laughs> <laughs> looking up the menu, <laughs> they have to pull out their phones to order. So right. <laughs> I schooled myself for being so quick to judge, but right, yeah. exactly. But right, um, it can really interfere with connection at a dinner table. So yeah. in our home, we have a rule: absolutely no phones at the dinner table. Love but it. It's so tempting sometimes because you're in a discussion and you're like, "What is the capital of? I don't know, Kazakhstan." Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you just want to like Google it real quick because you can get that fact that you're so quick. Yeah. But, but no. Yep. We got to kind of resist that urge sometimes. So yeah, as it you know, now I'm revealing what we talk about at dinner. But yeah, man, the capital because that, that's that's what we talk about at dinner, Dad. Okay, good. I'm not alone. <laughs> that's right. Uh, so good, so good, and out of the bedrooms uh, that could really interfere too. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, yep. Uh, and we did a podcast episode about this. I think it was number fifty three about technoference too. And so I, mm. what you're saying just resonates so well with. Mm. With these concepts yep yeah big one all right well uh as we conclude our interview today anything else you've told me once that love is no longer spelled time t-i-m-e it's something mm-hmm. else well, it, it used to be you know and we would hear the commercials and thing love you know t-i-m-e and i think that's good but i think dan that there's something that has replaced that there it's even more important but it, it includes time and that is your attention. I truly believe that one of the greatest gifts we can give our spouse or partner, even our kids, is not necessarily our time. It's our attention. Because now we live in an age where I can be sitting on the couch with my wife watching a movie, and I call it double screening, which is not healthy. You know, I have a screen here and a screen there. And we're spending time together, uh-huh. but we're our attention, it's, it's not on each other. Going out to eat, those kinds of reading a book with your, your kids, all of this requires our attention. And you know what the world right now and all these screens and social media, everything is screaming, not necessarily for your time. It wants your eyeballs. It wants your attention for that. And so truly, I think that is one of the greatest gifts. Now, attention requires time, but time doesn't necessarily require attention. So give Give your partner your all in attention. Put down, when my wife will call at work, I, I will literally turn away in my chair, away from my screen because I know I'll be, I'm easily distracted. So I will even get up and walk around and talk to her and then listen, be really all in, not perfect at this, but I really believe that attention, that's the greatest gift we can give. I love that. That's so good. So uh, let's say you're a couple and you're really good at, you know, bringing your whole heart. You can turn inward, up, outward, upward, and forward. You can, you have a good network of people you can trust and talk through. You're really good at giving each other, you know, attention, what we talked about, and adding those cups into the pool to mm-hmm. kind of build this reservoir of, of love. And now we're in the bedroom. What are your black belt sex tips? How do you oh, take man. sex to the next level from there? Yeah, you know what? I think, honestly, it has to be... Um, and this may sound a little bit weird, but okay, for men, it has to be about it has to be about her. You have to totally turn outward. Okay, now this may sound weird for women. It's all about you in a way. Okay, now don't don't jump on me. Don't get after me. I agree, one hundred percent. Yeah. Okay, because 
if, if, a, if a woman, again, I'm not a woman, but I've listened to a lot of podcasts, a lot of read a lot of things, talked to a lot of people. <laughs> if they are certainly, you know, focused or if they're distracted or whatever, if it's just on you, then it's really hard for them to feel what they need to feel, to get in the zone, to get in the mood. But if they honestly are paying more attention to themselves and letting letting go and if and if a man is being able to pay attention to and listen to and respond to her and not himself that in my mind leads to better connection a better emotional that intimate um, connection and so it's not necessarily both focusing on each other and there are times we need to do that so don't go i hope listeners aren't like oh i don't know but honestly women often have to focus more on them as men focus on them. Does that make sense? Or do you have any yeah, kickback on that? That's backed up by what Dr. Esther Perel, who's a sex researcher, talks about how female okay. sexuality is inherently narcissistic. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if if right. uh and, and you see it in Latin dances, right? Like mm. really these romantic dances. She's the one dressed up pretty, she has a pretty hair, the the more colorful dress, he is more conservatively dressed and he's more in pursuit of her like the attention's always on her in these yes. dances and it's about this dance and it really revolves around her and even in like olympic figure you know couples figure skating which we all love to see yeah uh, he's throwing her in the air she's the one doing the twists and the turns and the cool tricks and he does some too but it's it's he shows his strength but it's really the show's on her like she's a spotlight yeah and yes. I, I think that's something inherent about male and female sexuality. And there's a beauty in both. And so you bring that to the bedroom and it's okay for him to be really focused on her and her to be focused on herself. Like we Yeah. Said. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. I'm glad that that, that makes sense. Cause often I don't put it in a way and it's like, wait a minute, you know, that's selfish or whatever, but you said it perfectly that it is. Uh, and there's, there's give and take and there's times, you know, that, that sexual intimacy, that life, that, that process, that kind of that dance, it, it evolves, it evolves, it changes over time. And so that, that communication, make sure that we still are, we're open and feeling and women shouldn't feel like they can't talk about it, that they can't share, that it's not their job just to please their man or those kinds of things. So anyway, those are a few tips that I hope will be helpful. Great. Anything else you want to share with us today? No, you know, I, I appreciate you doing this. I think that what you're doing, Dan, is amazing. That the app, the 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 guests, the little tips here and there, it is, it's truly the small things that make for those great relationships. It's that that little cup of connection that we add to our relationship pool over time. Yeah, that we will we will feel that. But again, that is that lack of attention leads to loss of connection. Cool. Great. If people want to learn more about what you do, what's the best place to send them? Oh yeah, you know I've got a website, Doctor Dave Shram, dr dr Dave Shram dot com. That's where they can learn more about me. And we just launched our own podcast, Stronger Marriage um, Connection, as well, where we're helping couples, yeah, with their relationship connection as well. Great. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Dan. We hope that you enjoyed this episode of Get Your Marriage On. And if you did, we would love it if you would take a few seconds to give us a rating on iTunes and to share the show with your friends. They'll thank you for life. Once you've done that, you can head over to GetYourMarriageOn.com for more resources about today's topic and to download our amazing marriage apps. Now go get your marriage on. <laughs>